if you didn't play any competitive football, would you still? Is it possible for you? Still oh, I saw that coach? question. I saw that question. Sorry, I, I might have glossed over some of how, these. How, I mean, competitive, you, you need to have a certain level, right? You, so you need to have a certain level of understanding and expertise. Yeah. Right, so that, that although it is, it's not about the X's and O's, I, I can't go and coach w water polo. On this episode of Across the Line, we continue asking Chris Greatwich the tough questions. We got so many off of Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter, and we thank you for that. And uh, we got so many that we needed to cut it up in two parts. So if you missed part one, definitely go check this one out. This one is part two. If you enjoy it and you enjoy the football content that we provide, then definitely subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. Enjoy the show. If you were a national youth team coach, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, Brando, uh, Barambado, uh, <laughs> Barambado, nice, nice last name, <laughs> right? Um, if you were given the chance to be the program director, of the national youth teams, would you accept the challenge? In many ways, it's the dream job for me. Mm. In many ways. Okay, so there's definitely interest there. Um, if you were uh, to take on that job, yeah. how would you give the country a competitive youth program in tournaments like the SEA Games and I guess other youth um, competitions as well okay i think we've touched on it a little bit with um with pre previous podcasts mm. i touched on it a lot with alvin uh, and we discussed a little bit as well <coughs> ideally we want to get the government involved you get the government involved with projects so uh, whether it be municipalities building stadiums whether it be uh, or fields recreational facilities that kind of thing and then potentially implementation of programs within some sort of sporting curriculum curriculum so having football as part of a sports curriculum, PE curriculum that's rolled out blanket for kids mm. under the age of 10. I think that, that that's, that's a, a likely place to start, just to increase participation. I think that's, you've really got to try to increase participation on, on a general scale. And I think having uh, government implement some sort of legislation that would, that would make it part of the, the, the curriculum, I think that would be really, really a, a real good way to do it. <coughs> the secondly, there needs to be a level of engagement with the local FAs because I think some, again, we talked about this with Alvin, some FAs locally seem to be doing a great job. Some FAs seem to be doing sweet FA. So why are they not engaged? Yeah. But we also need to give those people an opportunity to get engaged. So I think one of the things that needs to be implemented is, is some sort of nat uh, national youth curriculum. Uh, this is something that Alvin and I spoke about in, in depth in our, in our podcast, which was released today. Um, there needs to be a real clear vision as to how how you're going to go about producing the next Chiefy Kalidong, the next Dali Borromeo, the next Dean Araneta, the next Phil Young Husband, you know, the next yeah. Stefan Schrock, you know, players of, of that kind of caliber. So, and if you're going to do that, then it, it's not as simple as just letting kids participate in two week camps and then sending them off to ASEAN competitions and thinking yeah. they're going to compete. It's, Grassroots programs take years and years of cultivating and it needs a, a, a real overhaul of, of what, in terms of what they have at the moment. Once you have a national curriculum in place, um, then that needs to be implemented by a director of youth who oversees that project. Mm -hmm. the, the governing bodies of the regional FAs need to be accountable for the players that they're producing. If they're not producing players, if they're not putting on competitions, right, then they shouldn't get their, their funding. And why do they get their funding? Because they get a vote, right? But if, That's not, right. But if yeah. they're not doing anything, what's the point in them being there, right? Yeah. It's simple, it's simple as. Then I think once you, I mean, every for me, every region needs to have their own regional league, right? I mean, I've said this in, in the podcast before, if you're going to have a regional football association, the first thing you should be doing is running a league, running a competition, year round, multiple age groups. Mm. Has to be. Right. right. There has to be a mandate. So you've got to try and get mass participation, having leagues, competitions. Then from there, there needs to be some sort of regional competition that will then enable all of those regional FAs to converge yep. okay then from there now you start to have a talent ID pool right who are the best players from Mindanao who are the best players in Versailles who are the best players in, in Luzon 
right? And then from there, then the pyramid then comes to, comes to its point, right? So then you get, okay, from those pools of players, yeah. they will then form the basis of a training pool for a youth national team, right? Yeah. And ID them early. Yeah. Right, ID them early. You don't have to have them in teams. You don't have to have them in competition year round. No, it's not what we're saying. It's not what we're saying at all. Yeah. What I'm saying is identify them at a young age. Knows know which players it are about. Right. Know what the eligibility is. Yeah. And then once they're in, in, okay, they're on the short list. Okay, we've got a pool of maybe 50 kids at you, every age group. Okay, now we can look to try and test them in in competition. And I don't mean just competition nationally. Yeah. Because but but. That's still better than what we have because I, I, none of these kids are getting consistent, regular, competitive games. Yeah. I look at my academy. We have probably three good games a year, four good games a year, mm. right? That's if we play Malaya twice, <laughs> right? Right. And two right. of those against, uh, two against the same team. Right, 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 right. So the other games we're winning 5-0, 6-0. 7-0, you at YFL, 8-0. Waste of time. Then yeah. they go to the final and then we have a competitive game. That's it. So, so, you, so yeah, so, so, so going, going back, and, then, and that's generally how a lot of it's done because it's not got, at the moment it's not going through the clubs. I think the clubs are doing a piss poor job of developing grassroots. It's too top down. I think people have been lazy. Mm. Federation and the league are letting them get away with murder. Mm. But I get it. You need to pull all your resources in, in order to have a league. Right. Right. So I, I kind of get it. But I think, you know, clubs, clubs, need youth programs to be compliant with AFC. Yeah. Right. So you need to have certain criteria. So they, they also need to get their act together and not just pillage because there's a lot of that going along. So clubs will, will not have their own youth academy. They'll just go and pick from a school or pick from another club, a yeah. pre-existing club or whatever, which is not acceptable. That's not what we're about. We're about developing. Mm -hmm. So from, yeah, sorry, going back on, off that. So that's, that's, another, that's another entity altogether. The clubs need to be doing more with their youth development. But if you're talking about from a PFF, youth national team perspective, from there, yeah, then you're looking to try and compete internationally if possible. You know, go into these tournaments, go into regional competitions, see where you really are versus, let's say initially, your Vietnams, <coughs> Thailand's, yeah. Indonesia's. You've got to start there. You know, yeah. I'm not saying we go off and try and compete with Japan or South Korea or any of these teams because... They've got bottomless pits of money to try and develop their systems that have been ongoing for a number of years. Um, and then I think once they're in the system, so once you, and, and, and have gone through the mill a little bit, hopefully once you get to sort of between that sort of 16 to 18 year old period, you're gonna have kids that have come through the pathway, right? That are under a curriculum, so they should understand a certain style of play, yeah. understand a certain philosophy, Right, I think England called it the England DNA, mm. and we talked about this with Alvin. There's no, there's no point getting in. He was talking about the Japanese coach that's in, and he's trying to coach the Japanese way, which is, which is great. Yeah, Jeremy yeah. played unbelievable football, but we have very distinct di differences here versus what they have in Japan. So why don't we cater for the audience that we've got here, for the player that we can produce here? Right, right. So. I think there are certain logistical factors that we need to think about. There is, there are certain deficiencies that we need to think about, but. You know, I think F Filipinos, by nature, are fast. By nature, they're athletic. By nature, they're fighting spirit. Yeah, you could easily implement a f high tempo, high pressing, aggressive style of play. Yeah, that's geared towards quick counter attacking football, um, breaking at lightning pace, similar to what you see with Klopp, that little Liverpool style. Right, relentless ninety minutes, high tempo yeah. energy, R rather than a slow, methodical possession game. Right? Yeah, I, I don't see it. I think it's going to be very hard. The other thing you've got to factor in with that is we play on pretty crappy fields for a lot of these kids. Yeah, yeah. Right? So in order to, to try and build out from the back on a crummy field, like, okay, yeah. that's very difficult. And I'm not saying, listen, with our academy, it's, man, it's mandatory. You have to try and build out from the sure. back. We play on probably m m better fields. We, we play at ACC, yeah. Alloran Country Club. We train at McKinley Hill Stadium. There's no excuse. Like, if your field's nice, you should be able to play. Sure. Right? Um, and you know, is that the right way? I don't know. I mean, that, that's that's just something I've just. All that I'm just discussing off factoring what, what what a lot of the probably the Filipino general um, public have to deal with. You right. know, they're not going to be playing on manicured fields. They're not mm. going to be playing on these pristine surfaces. So you might have to have a game plan that's, that, that's tailored for that or catered to that. The key is though that you develop a style of play. Style of play, yeah. Right. So <clears throat> two things, right? That um, if you don't mind, we take a a, a bit of a, a a tangent real quick. Sure. Two things. One is I read a book about um, 
Spain and how they put together their golden generation that won yeah. the, the World Cup and the Euros. Graham, right? Graham Hunter's book. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen to his podcast. Yeah, Brilliant. yeah. There's like top. 50 volunteer coaches. Um, they have a network that's essentially keeping tabs on all the players and all of these different age groups, right? They put yeah. them together, two or three um, candidates per position, and they, they go through the ranks. Like Sergio Busquets and David Villa have been playing together for 10 years prior to them getting involved with the senior team. Yeah, That's the kind of <clears throat> chemistry <clears throat> that they were able to create because of the fact that this program existed, that they were playing in regional sp- sp- yeah. uh, places and they will be brought together through these uh, network of volunteer coaches. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, that's sort of what we need yeah. in Mindanao, in, in Visayas, and in, in Luzon. Um, a network of coaches that are volunteers. They're not getting paid for this. Yeah. this is, they're doing it because they want to create this the best possible national team. Yeah. Secondly, Vietnam just won the SEA Games, mm-hmm. just won the AF, AFF Suzuki Cup. Yeah. Their senior team is composed of mostly early 20s yeah. and younger, yeah. right? Competing at the AFC level in the youth stage as well. Um, Ivan Gallares, who is um, media officer of Ceres, he was just talking to some of the Vietnamese contingents over there, uh, delegates in the AFC Cup uh, draw, and he was saying like, "Congratulations, they well done." Um, you know, if we had the same kind of uh, support in our federation, um, maybe things would be different. And the mm-hmm. guy's like, "I'm going to cut you off right there." Federation had nothing to do with it. It was all the clubs. Mm-hmm. The clubs had come together. And decided that, you know, we're going to start building legitimate youth programs, yep. bring in European resources mm-hmm. and bring them over here so that we can begin learning how to create a proper youth system. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was the clubs coming together and creating an umbrella of, of quality youth academies that they can then select individuals from to make it into the youth setup. And then from there, it's like, it's up to you guys. Now, how do you want to utilize these youth teams, right? But yeah had nothing to do with the federation, yeah. right? And that's it, it, some sort of like, when you hear news like that, it, it, it provides a sense of optimism because you don't have to trust in the federation. And, yeah. you know, the history of the federation, I mean, no disrespect to everybody in the federation. I mean, you can't do it alone. You can't, the fed, we can't rela- wait on the federation to get their act together so that we can get our act together. No. You know what I mean? So it's a two-pronged approach perhaps, you know, like it, we could have the, the clubs come together, do their thing, at the same time, start making steps to make the federation more efficient yeah. at developing youth programs, and perhaps five how, years, ten how, years down the road. How, yeah, how many clubs? How many clubs <laughs> does Vietnam have in the V League? That's know? a good question. No, I do yeah, not. I don't know. I don't know. Because obviously, like I, I've seen quite a lot of the Vietnamese youth um, programs that are ongoing. I know they have a lot of pro clubs. Yeah, uh, big big pro clubs that have been going over there doing stuff. I know Juventus have been there recently and been doing stuff there. Sure. Um, it's. But I'm, I'm looking at it. So of the six clubs, six, seven clubs in uh, PFL this yeah, year, yeah, yeah. how many of them have bona fide youth structures? I know we do. Um, Kaya. Um, Ceres, do they? I mean, Ceres has, has, has the team. Yeah. But I'm not sure how aligned it is with the men's team. Yeah. Obviously, they have their their influence with the with the university, which I'm going to come on to in a minute with the university. Mm-hmm. Archers have, have their tie-up with the school. Yeah. yeah. Right, so, that, so there's that. Mendiola have links to San, San Beda, Beda. Right. Um, Stallions, they, 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 they're starting to do some stuff. They try to align themselves with MFC also. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, what we talked talk, talk about, about aligning with other academies. Mm. Um, Air Force, they've had their Fleet Marine Academy before, right, I think, which was... A lot of the Air Force kids will pay for Fleet Marine, but it's not, I don't know how, I think that's a loose affiliation. Yeah. Um, who am I left with now? Come on, you're in the league. Right. What have I said? That's it? Is that it? Have I named, have I named all I the teams? So, yeah. Oh, global. Global, oh. which is gone. Yeah. Right? We'd, okay. So, we'd rather so, not speak so, about So what I'm saying here is, there's nobody there with a proper use. Right, but what you're talking, this is where I'm talking about having a Filipino approach, right? So let's let's go a little bit off topic from what we said about if I was in charge of the youth national team, right? Yeah. So let's talk, if we wanted to do it with the clubs, I think if, if, if clubs don't have the resources to set up their own academy, let, let's say the way we're doing it, I think that there needs to be a more bona fide affiliation with the schools, with the institutions. Mm. Like Archers, for example, if they're attached with LaSalle, yeah. there's thousands of kids there. Mm. to pull from across all of the LaSalle plus all the other LaSalle, LaSallean schools across the across the country yeah yeah right 
Um, Ateneo is, is across the country also, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, wh why are <clears> they not being tapped into for their pipeline? It's a good question. Right? Yeah. I mean, wh why, why would we not try to align ourselves with them? And not, uh, maybe it might be a loose affiliation, but why not, let's say, if Ceres does have an affiliation with LaSalle, yeah. why don't we say, like, look, listen, there's a genuine pathway, which they have done. They've, they have got the, some of the, set, the, the Bacola kids have come in and played with the, with the first team. Mm -hmm. Right? So that has happened. But why not have that implementation, right? This is how the Ceres team plays. So they play obviously Spanish style, mm -hmm. right? Have them coach their coaches. Have them coach their kids that way. Yeah. And have them work on that pipeline. And there's literally thousands and thousands of kids that they could potentially pull from from that program and have that bona fide under their under their system because the series one that's up here is just pretty much for kids based in the in the metro right yeah yeah but it's no real affinity to the actual men's team as far as i'm aware <clears throat> it's interesting yeah right and then if mendiola is already attached to san beda right there's a pool right there there's a pool of players that you can network from from there yeah feu feu has so many kids i know they used to do it with loyola right i mean they used to have a lot of uh, FEU boys would go straight to Loyola, like Amita, yeah, um, yeah. Bugas. They were all in the they were all in the Loyola Academy. Connection with uh, coming through <clears throat> with Vince, Vince with Vince. Santos, yeah. But that's a natural one, yeah. That's a natural one there, and just have them come through the pipeline together. I don't know if 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 the if the if the league is trying to go down that route where maybe some of those school teams would then become bona fide clubs themselves. Hmm. Right. Maybe. Right, maybe right. that's. Maybe that's. That's, that's the thing. Something. It's always been the case that it's been clubs versus schools. But it's why not? Been that case. Why not be clubs and schools? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. sounds like a real logical <clears throat> way to do it. Yeah. But if you don't, we don't have a youth academy. Okay. But the school has a youth academy, but they can't play in the pro league. Yeah. yeah but we're in the pro league, right? And and we're not going to get the investment, right? No, no offense, but we're not Vietnam, so we're not going to get the investment. I don't think foreign investment coming in. And we're not going to get Juventus coming in and setting yeah, up blanket because yeah. there isn't the, the market isn't there. I don't think the money isn't there. Mm. Right from the club owners, they're not willing to invest that kind of money. So then we have to try to create the pathways for these kids. Surely aligning with the schools yeah. who have the kids, who have the product, but you ha sorry, but the clubs have the product, i.e. the, the coaches, the, resor the, um, the resources, the manpower. Like yeah. it, these coaches can come in and these players can come in and do a clinic and, to, and or, or at least talk to them about this is how we play at, this is how we play at Sarah's this is this is the way in which we do our do our thing yeah you know imagine the buzz that these kids would get off the back of that um, and, and as a as an offshoot to that is that you're creating that community that we we've been speaking about for the last few episodes about how do we nurture a football community that is not actually involved in playing the game or is actively connected to you in some shape or form right i mean that's i, I think i think that the, hits the, a few birds uh, well one stone well, it's it's a one stone that hits a lot a lot a lot of yeah, things mate it's a flock coach, of birds it's coach development yeah building the community developing players yeah there you go right for for me it's it's, it's a logical way in which you could do it so if you can't if you can't if you're not going to get it through the, the government if you're not going to get it through the federation you can't just go oh they're not doing it are they yeah, yeah. Right. And there's nothing we can do. No. And, and what Alvin was saying as well, you, you just got. To, what did he say? I think you had to tidy your own garden. That was his thing. That was his that's phrase, right? You have, to, you have to clean your own garden. Yeah. And that's what we're doing with our club, right? Are we doing it right every time? No, maybe not. But we got to start somewhere. So sure. We'll, I'll start with. I'll start with my own garden. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Is that it? Is that, is that right for no, that? No, that, no. Is that we, one? We, we've got a lot. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, is that for, okay yeah, for that yeah. question? Have I answered that all right? For sure. I, I waffled on a little bit there. And I, went, <laughs> I went all over the shop, but yeah. Okay, let's, let's go an easy one. Best Please. player you've gone up against? Uh, um, club and national team level. Carl Angel de Luna. Omar from uh, UAE. I'm not even going to attempt to Omar. say his last, his last name. Uh, oh, that was a... Sideshow Bob here. Long hair, yeah, with a yeah, 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 right, with a frizzy oh, hair. Unbelievable. Wasn't he like uh, Asian Player of the Year a couple of times, mate? Couldn't even get near him on a regional level. I like Bayaki Kaizen. Who? Bayaki, the centre back from Singapore. Oh. Kaizen, yeah. Um, ended up being pally with him now, so we we we, we talk. Um, I always felt as a centre back in this region, he was one of the best. He was the best. He was the best. Mm. Very aggressive. He used to give Phil a hard time. Good leader. For me, he was the best. The best player on the sort of regional level. Who I, I played against consistently. 
right. during my he's, he's of my age so we would play against each other for a long time he was always someone I had a lot of time and respect for great player so those two national team level national team level club level um oh, you off. know what it, it's very difficult i i don't think i was the best player but i'd never f at this level i never felt like Anybody? i never felt i never felt out of, no yeah no never i never felt uh, playing against any opponent that i i he's got the better of me or he, he's i couldn't handle that player yeah yeah a couple of times i've been in games where i thought he might have got the better of me on that day do you want to know who they were sure i played against robert lopez mendy <laughs> when he played center midfield for forza and it was a it was a charity cup or something like that or one of the mickey mouse cups that we had and the field was waterlogged and it was the last group game and the game should have been postponed. They played the game. All Mendy did was go around and just smashed people. I was scared of him. Straight up scared. Yeah. Um, but for some some reason, he was also able to like manipulate the ball and I was like, bloody hell, this guy's a bit different. And I followed him thereafter and lo and behold, was my first signing for Kai. Um, but I always admired him after that. Uh, I I had a lot of time for um, Junior Gay when he came from uh, when he came to Stallions the first time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I tried to sign him the second <clears> time, <throat> but he put on a ton of weight from when he when he, he moved back to Oman, I think, or something like that. Mm. And he came back and he was out of shape. But Junior Gay when he first came was a formidable player. Mm. Um, who else in in the domestic league? No, oh, not 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 many. I don't I don't think. I was ever that. I, I felt overly challenged in the in the domestic game. Yeah, that I would single out as being someone I would earmark for that. Monica, no, but national team, those, yeah, def, um, I was unbelievable. Best player I've ever, best player I've ever played against. I think. Yeah, yeah, class. And then Bayaki Kaizen on the on the regional level, top player. All right. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but Justin Bass had a, a mm. little situation with Malaysia where we won yeah. in that match, and he'd come out and you know high five the Malaysian players in rather enthusiastic fashion. Mm. Um, your thoughts on that? This one's coming from FC Sipa. Post game victory. Yeah. Um, in an emotional game, I've done stupid stuff <laughs> or stuff that's perhaps been a little overzealous. Yeah. Um, listen don't be too harsh on the kid yeah. right? he's a young guy he won an emotional game um, yeah he's been a bit enthusiastic with the clap yeah is that, is that the word that you said enthusiastic yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Enthusiastic? Uh, you know I've seen people saying oh, it's, it's a distinct lack of class Listen, you try playing in that type of environment and see if you can keep your crap together. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. It's very emotional, right? <laughs> Everyone's amped up. Yeah. They yeah. won the game in a must win game. Don't be too hard on the guy. What is he gonna be super proud of it in ten years' time? Probably not. Yeah. But you know, maybe as he gets older, a bit more mature, maybe you can be a little more dignified in, in and gracious in victory. But for those fans who are Malaysian fans who are having sour grapes I'm sorry you lost the game you had a chance <laughs> right if your players had played with as much passion as he showed yeah. then that, that team might have been a bit better you know and, all, and for all the Filipino fans that are trying to make out that oh he's shamed the country and stuff get a life <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> right the guy the guy's just played in a really emotional game he's, he's got a little bit he's got a little bit over the top with his celebration yeah yeah, yeah or whatever it's no big deal let him be let him be yeah he'll learn no from it he's like a nice guy i met him the other day he's not nice enough chap so yeah yeah i think he's all right this one's from bernardo 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 that's his um instagram handle um which is much too long and three times too many i think i, I like it yeah yeah i'm all for it just <laughs> yeah. in case you forget except when you're gonna tag him for something it's like oh bernardo yeah bernardo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah anyways yeah. will you manage a pro team again oof I touched on it a little bit, didn't I? Um, reasons for leaving last year. Um, mm. Last year? Year before? Whatever. Um, Kaya. I think the PFL needs to be on a more stable footing. Mm. If I was to come back it, and coach it is, it's not. Here. It's not specific here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, a pro team rather pro than... Pro team, yeah. So not not national team. Yeah, 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 yeah. club level. Club, right, yeah, go back to club level. Yeah, go back to club level. Yeah, um, yeah one day I will. 
Um, anytime soon? Let's see. I said I'd answer anything, didn't I? Yeah. Let's yeah. see. I mean, first of all, so I've got to finish off a few things license-wise. Um, I've got to finish off a few. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm still involved with the academy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and, and still very heavily involved with that. Um, contractual obligations with that. And there's a few other things. This podcast. Yeah, imagine if I had to leave the podcast. What would we do? Unthinkable. Unthinkable. So, um, short term, no. It's not, it's not going to happen, I don't think, in the short term. But, um, listen, I've had opportunities. I've had opportunities to do stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, stuff like, well, I can't talk about. Um, but some, some, I had some really good opportunities to go and coach at some big clubs and do some really exciting stuff, which I turned down. Um, in the future, uh, for me, like I said to you earlier, I miss the competitive, I miss the day-to-day mm. um, nature of football. Yeah. So will I come back to that at some point? At some point. Um, but the stars need to align. I'm not in any rush to go and yeah. jump into the first offer that comes my way. So... Um, Watch this space. I think I'll be taking, I'll be going down that route again at some stage. I would like to. I would like to. Um, so we'll see. I suppose that is the way to, to fill the, that every day wanting to be around the game, you know, in buzz. and out the practices. Yeah, I miss the buzz. I do miss the buzz. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Looking forward to it. Okay. Um, you spoke a little bit about licenses. You mm. need to get a license. Um, there's been... Uh, this one's a question coming from Bill Pakatang or Pakatang. Yeah. Um, not sure how to say that, but um, Bill's pointing out that um, Kesuka Honda speaking a little bit about you know licenses mm. and, and saying that um, you know the, the whole process or whole structure of having to get your license before you can coach is kind of ruining coaching in a in a particular way. He what he was saying is that um, you don't need a license to become a professional manager is what he tweeted, Honda did, on September 14. The system is no longer aligned with a profession. Should you need a license to become a professional businessman? That was the question that he posted, right? There are people who excel in business who never went to business school, right? And what he's saying is that why is it necessary for you to, re- to have a license if you just want to coach and you feel like you, you're good at it? You can see things that other licensed coaches perhaps cannot. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, obviously you okay. are in the process of getting your licenses. So as well. I, I had this same, I had this same argument a long time ago with someone. Can't tell you who, but I had this argument with someone, and his argument was, uh, you can't be a surgeon if you haven't gone to medical school. Correct. So I turned around and said, well, football's very different to performing brain surgery. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like, mm. and I agree with Honda in terms of what he's saying. I know tons of coaches with A licenses, pro licenses who are god awful. Mm. God awful. I know coaches who have no coaching licenses whatsoever are fantastic coaches. Fantastic coaches. Right. Uh, I went on my, I did my B and my A license last year, finished off the course this year. I've got a few bits of paperwork to be done, but that, that's, it's really a formality. So I've, I've done my, all of my A license course that I have to go through to, in order to get my A license. So mm. basically just got to fill out a few bits of paperwork and then it's done. Nice. With regards to the course itself, a lot of it, they teach you a way to coach. Okay. Okay, they teach you a way to coach. Now, I had been coaching for a long time. I was probably one of the most experienced coaches on that course not I don't know if you know about the course that I went on but the, co- the coaching course that I went on was almost exclusively for professional players that's so, right so on my course uh, you're without sort of name dropping but I'm going to name drop we had um, uh, Ricardo Carvalho yeah, that's number one was on my, was yeah. on my course <laughs> yeah. right the first name on the sheet yeah. right was the first name <clears throat> we had Stephen Pienaar was on the course Jermaine Jones was on the course Richard Dunn, Julian Lescott. So we had all these players with Premier League experience, mm. uh, international experience. Um, won Champions Leagues. Now, I'll give you Ricardo Carvalho um, as an example. He, his first session, he did a session. So I was in his group, he did a session. And uh, we had to coach, I think it was 5v5. And when he did his session, he didn't stop it. He didn't 
alter anything. He didn't change anything. He didn't um, adjust the session in okay. any way. So the assessor stopped it and said, listen, Ricardo, you have to stop it and then coach it and do certain, manipulate the players in order to achieve the outcome of the topic. Mm. So he said, okay, no problem. So then he went, and then by the end of the week, he was able to, to um, apply his ideas within a framework that would bring out the topic, his philosophy, his ideas, ideas within the session. Okay. Does that make sense? So within that period of time, he um, was able to basically have his ideas from being in his head to be able to put it out on the field. Okay. So that was from that perspective, it was good for him. Now, he might have done that on the course, but he might have done that just if he did coached for two or three months, watched some coaches, mm. observed some sessions, and had some assistance from a, a coach mentor, for example. Okay. Right. So what I'm saying is he's acquired all of that knowledge for the 20 years he's had at playing at the highest, highest level. And he just needed someone to bring out the way in which he wanted to express his ideas. Okay. Simply put. So, and I think a lot of the players on that course were, were, the, were the same. So by the end of that week, they were all coaching and information was at a really high level. Now, for me, if you're gonna coach from a tactical perspective, I actually don't think it's that difficult. Mm. I don't think it's that difficult. You put any player in this room and you put them on a board here and they can explain. They can explain how they want a team to play. And actually judging by the course that I went on, a lot of these coaches don't want to coach. They want to manage, mm. which is two different things. They don't necessarily want to be on the field taking the session. They want to pick the team. Yeah. They want to mold the team in the shape of themselves. Right. An assistant coach can do the session, but I want to, I want to steer the ship, so mm. to speak. So, so anyway, I, I, I've seen tons of tons of people like that on on the course, and. Actually, the most learning that I had on the coaching course was in the conversations that I had with the, with, with the cohort. With her? With the cohort, with the other people in, on the group. Mm. Other people on the course with me. So the sessions themselves, I found uh, interesting. It's, it's a way in which to coach. I would very seldom coach the way they told me to coach. So f in terms of specific methodology, the it's not... The methodology is not in aligned with how I would coach the game. Okay. But the picking the brains of the individuals that were there. Perfect. That's what it that's, is. That's what it's about. And that's when I came off the course. And it's, don't get me wrong, there's certain things of what they did I really liked and I really enjoyed. Yeah. And there's certain things that I, I took from it that I now implement in my daily sessions. Mm. Um, and I get it. If you want to drive a car, you need a license. Right? I, 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 I do get it. Yeah. Um, but, correct me if I'm wrong, the quote is, is to be a good coach, um, you, do, do you need to have a license? Because if that's what it is, you don't have to be. To become a professional manager is what right, you're saying. to be a professional manager. Yeah. Because as I said, as I alluded to earlier, the game really, at its essence, as a coach, the game for the coaches to build the relationship with the players. Right. That's really what it's about. I listened to a really good podcast the other day with Steve Kerr. Yeah. Their okay. Golden State Warriors the coach. Yeah. And he said he went and shadowed some coaches mm. from um, from different sports. Uh, Seattle Seahawks, I think he went at uh, the NFL team, other, other coaches um, from other sports. And he was saying that actually the X's and O's don't matter. The X's and O's really don't matter. When you get to a certain level, right? Sure. You know the game. Mm, Honda has his ideas, right? For sure. Mm. Honda knows what he wants out of a team, right? For sure. 100%. If he has an assistant coach who can work with him, who can help deliver the sessions, he could be the manager. No problem. As long as he can express himself, express his ideas. And you've seen his teams play. Yeah. Play unbelievable football. Proper football. So he, football. Must, he yeah. must be doing something right. Yeah. He must be doing something right. But what it also suggests to me is that he must be really good at building those relationships with the players. Right. To, right. For them to buy into what he's saying is actually the key. Right. Is actually the key. So for me is, if you've got someone who's amazing at building relationships, he's amazing at making the players feel great. 
mm. right? Is able to get the best out of their players, whether it be by pushing the right buttons, whether it be putting an arm around a player, you know, whether it be I'm really good at, okay, I understand this guy's a visual learner, so I'm going to show him video mm. of things that he did well, things that he did wrong, how he can improve. That's really the essence of being a coach, no, I think. You, you mentioned that there is a difference, though. Coach and a manager. Yeah. What do you see yourself more as? Coach. Coach. Yeah. Meaning creating the specific sessions required yes. to build um, the type of skills and uh, tactical knowledge yes. required to execute on the pitch. Yes. On game day. Yes. And a manager would be more of just... Um, creating the character or value system, what, what, are you, what, what yep. would you say is yep. the difference in that? Yep. I think yeah, I spot on. Okay. I think you're spot on. So he would be the architect of the whole environment. Mm. So that is everything from, especially in England, it's, the manager is more hands-on. Mm. So the manager is more in direct, direct connection with the chairman, is in more direct, you know, obviously, so he has to deal with managing up, has to deal with managing, with the, managing the press, right. has to deal with managing um, the well-being of the group in terms of the dynamic. Mm. Right, managing individual players, their well-being, any contractual dis disputes or issues that, that those players might have. Right, you know. So what I found was, as someone for me who likes being on the grass, I didn't enjoy that aspect of the job. Mm. Being a head coach, I didn't enjoy that. So that part of things, you'd rather there was a manager who was there who could handle all those things and let you do your thing with the team. Yes, huh. that's that's really what I'm getting at. And then what I'm saying with with Honda in that in that example, he's spot on. Right, he's spot on. Because he, he might be the opposite. He might be an amazing coach. He might be, he, I don't know, I don't know the dynamic of the Cambodian setup. Yeah, yeah. But if he's the one on the pitch, doing the session, delivering the session, yeah. right? Then he can have a proxy, right? He can have a proxy and he can be like, right, okay, fine, yeah. This is the, this is the head coach because he's got his license or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right? But if you're going to ask me who's going to take, you know, who, who do I want taking the team? Who do I want to, to, to make the decisions? Yeah, for sure it's going to be someone who I, who I think has the knowledge and is able to connect with the players on a personal level yeah. you know, I'll pick that guy every time over the guy who's, who's got the license it's very interesting you know like th there's the reasoning behind putting together a licensure program is like making sure that the tide continues to r rise mm -hmm. right I mean you're guaranteeing that people who are at a professional level at the minimum have this level of expertise or know-how but at the same time it's stifling individuals who have the passion and capability to do it right now and don't have three years or whatever to go through C, B, and A because I got to wait for the results and blah, blah, blah. I have to go, I have to wait for the schedule to come out and I could be coaching right now. Um, a top club, for example, if I was, uh, I just recently retired as a player and I've got the capabilities to do it, then no, you got to jump through some hoops, unfortunately. I mean, I did it, yeah. right? And, and listen, no, nothing on that course could have prepared me for what? I learned as doing the actual job. Right. Nothing. So for individuals who are looking to get into coaching um, professional clubs, knowing that you're going to have to jump through these hoops anyway, you better get started as soon as possible. Right? Yeah. Uh, listen, Aris used to kill me. Get, in the, get your badges done. Get your badges done all the time. Get your badges yeah. done. I wish I'd done it earlier. However, you try getting on the coaching course here in the Philippines. It's tough. So tough. Try finding a window to do it. Right. And I've sat in the classroom and I've done it and it's... Just now it's it's stuffy and it's yeah you know it's it's it's, it's hard to get you know it, where are you staying like I, mean, I went and did mine in Ireland right we had a nice hotel we had great training facilities mm. and with a great group of guys um, the guys that came in and did the, did the talks and the um, presentations and stuff they were superb so you know for me it was it was a no brainer that I go and do that plus it was quicker mm. right I could go I can go to Ireland do my UA for coaching badges and get it quicker than I could do it here. Wow. Right? And that's a UEFA for qualification. Yeah. Right? With some of the best players of my generation on the courts. Doesn't make sense, does it really? Like yeah. surely it should be easier to get it done here. Um, I'm sure there are, there are logistical issues and, and permutations behind why it's so hard to get it done here. Yeah. Maybe just not the numbers to get on the course. That is also it. But I think also the, there needs to be a, a, the pathway needs to be clear and it needs to be more accessible to right. a broader number because I know for a fact I'm going up to these YFL competitions mm. no one's qualified <clears throat> or very few 
qualify with a with a proper license. With, right, right, right. with AFC, not even a C or a B. Right, right, right. Not even. Mm. So, and and then you're entrusting your children, your children's development to these guys. Yeah. Right. So then that's a problem. So then this. this so okay. So then then this is where I also have a problem. Right. With 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 the, with the, the licensing though. Just because you. The, just because you're an ex-player doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Right? Okay. Just because you're a horse doesn't mean you're going to be a good jockey. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's also, I think, something that people need to. There needs to be a distinction between that because there are plenty of ex-players. Yeah. Right. People who've played the game who think, right, okay. Well, I know a bit about football. I'm just going to rock up, and you guys are going to listen to me because I played. Sure. But no, it comes back to what I said before. Like you might have been a great footballer. Yeah. But are you a dick? Are you an asshole? Yeah. Right? So again, so, so, so things I shouldn't say on it. But uh, can you build relationships with these people? Yeah. Right? And then that's when it comes back to what I said to you before. It's not about the X's and O's to be a coach. It really is about the ability to build relationships with your players and have them play for you. Right. Okay. All right. Did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honda does not need to get his coaching badges. And if he does, he should just be given it. <laughs> Do you plan on coaching any collegiate teams? Nope. Okay, JP Camp um, in Con Stirva. Uh, I would assume um, there's a few of these that 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 ask that same question. If you would be, you know, willing to get yourself into the collegiate ranks, doesn't and, appeal to me here. Yeah, I'd assumed. I mean, I, I like I like the idea of the collegiate atmosphere. Actually, I like it's on TV, and I like that um, mm. uh, the school spirit aspect is is really good. But just for me, the level and um, the format of it seems a bit obscure to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I don't like the idea of going out and recruiting players um, yeah. here in the Philippines. I think I'd, I'd feel limited and stifled to an extent. It's very aggressive recruitment as well. And yeah, and the pool is so small, so you're all recruiting for the same players. Yeah, it's tough. And then once you recruit them, you, there's this weird dynamic that happens where the, the kid kind of owes you four years of their life, and you don't like, you don't want to loan them out. You don't want to give them out to clubs, and yeah. you're stifling their development because. Yeah. They're forced to play in that in that that um, collegiate level, yeah. whereas, whereas they could be dipping their toes in in, in higher levels of yeah. competition. I so, agree. Yeah, there's an issue there. All right, so here's one from Eros Miyuga, uh, as a former player and manager of uh, Kaya Football Club. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate or describe your experience at Kaya and uh, in your in your Philippine football career? And in your honest opinion, do you think that the club will get a PFL title in the future? Okay, so two questions there, yeah? Yeah. What's the first one again? Say it again. Um, your summarize? experience. Your experience. Your, yeah, your experience with the club. Um, yeah, there, there's actually, maybe maybe I can couple this with Go one on more. Yeah. There's another person who was asking about why you stayed loyal to Kaya as okay. opposed to like uh, other yeah. opportunities. I mean, yeah, first of all, I, I, when I came over, it was initially... I was initially working in the US, coaching, uh, playing a little bit. And I knew that the league was taking off here. Right, right. Um, the academy system was about to be um, transformed by having a, a UFL youth league. So I was aware of those, those um, movements that was ongoing within football, football in the Philippines. Santi Aranetic flew to New Jersey where I was living at the time and, and sold me on the project, so I came. And... And he was right, you know, the academy had legs. It just needed to be developed. And I worked like a dog for two years, pretty much straight in order to try and bring it up to a, to a level that I was semi happy with. We've got a lot of kids in through the door and some of the fruits of our labor are starting to come through now. So we've got a lot, a lot, of, a lot of kids are in the youth national team now at the U15 level, which was really the first group that we had that came through as eight, seven, eight year olds. So that's that's a really nice thing to see. See these kids come through and develop. Um, so that that as a project, I'm I'm really invested in and I really enjoyed. So mm. it was that was always. So the youth project was already part of the reason was, why you're here. Was the anchor really that, that right. behind everything? The playing and then was, as a byproduct of that, being able to play with the national team was 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 also something that I want uh, was attractive in in moving mm. and moving to the Philippines. So that was good. Um, yeah, I love the club. Uh, we had a great team i felt as though i was um an important figure within the, 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 the 11 starting 11 um which was important to me i needed to go somewhere i felt valued uh, as a player and 
to a large extent, it, the, whatever coach we had tended to build a team around me, which was good. Um, I always felt we were probably two or three players shy every cycle. I think we had a few different cycles mm. within that group. You know, we had, um, when I first came, you know, that sort of Nate Berkey crew, I think we had some good players, but ultimately we were a couple of players shy. Then we had, you know, Dave's group, which, you know, the sort of Richard Greer era, I would yeah. probably class that as, you know, uh, Pablo Aracil, Rodriguez, that group. Yeah. Again, a couple of players shy of really, that was probably the closest I felt we were winning the title. Um, then my, the, the cup winning team built around sort of Louis Clark. Um, OJ. Yeah, OJ. Mm. Uh, and obviously Massa was probably the, the anchor again in, in all of those teams. Yeah. But I really enjoyed playing, in, playing, in, playing at the club. I thought we, we were doing things right on, for the most part compared to other teams. And um, yeah, I just, just enjoyed playing. It was never really, I never really looked at going anywhere else. There's a funny story. I apparently, I spoke to, <laughs> I spoke to an agent probably two or three years after 2010 Suzuki Cup. And apparently there was a deal on the table for me to go and move to the A-League shortly after. Really? Yeah, I had no idea. Australia. Uh, Australia. <laughs> Australia, yeah, and then um, the coach who had the who had the deal lined up for me was fired, and then that never came to fruition. But I didn't have a clue about it, so there was ah. nothing. Nothing was tabled until I met the agent about three years after. Would you have gone uh, at the time? Yeah, I would have. I'd had nothing. Yeah. I had nothing going for me, so yeah, I would. Have, I would have gone. Um, but no, the and then uh, obviously during the period where I was playing in the Philippines, it wasn't like, like it is now. Mm where a lot of the players are now moving to to Thailand. Or yeah, was, yeah, you know, yeah. it's not, that wasn't the market then. It wasn't really happening. We didn't have a high enough profile. The league wasn't strong enough. We hadn't, we weren't competing at AFC level. So, you know, it, it wasn't really a, an option for me at, at, at that time. But well, I think that, had it been now, yeah, yeah, I think I would have gone. I think I would have gone. I think I would have tried, tried my luck and playing in one of these top leagues. Yeah, you'd have to, huh? Yeah. Like your competitive nature would have yeah. had, like I got to test yeah, myself. I would have given it a go. Interesting. So yeah, and then what was the other question? Do I see them winning the league? Yeah, I just think Sarah's a too dominant at the moment. If you want a short answer, um, I think the club would, if they really want to push, would probably have to make significant investment. Mm. Um, that being said, you don't know if Sarah's are going to invest in the way in which they have done. But if they keep the coach and if they keep the players that they've got, it's going to be tough. I mean, you've seen Bayern dominate in Germany for, I think is it seven on the trot they've won. Yeah, you know, I've seen Celtic win the Scottish Premier League. I think they're on eight in a row. I think it's eight in a row now they've won. Wow! So, um, you know, most leagues are monopolies. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the way it is. You, yeah. you read Soconomics? You read that book? No, not, not it's, should, it's been on my you shelf. Should it, you mate. should read it, mate. It's really good. Um, you should read it, and it just basically says, yeah, if you think you're in the only league where one team dominates, yeah, no, nah. I mean the American sports league is different. They put the caps, the and caps, the, and the draft system and stuff, where you, it, it enables there to be some sort of parity. Yeah, yeah, but actually, that's not that's not what you want. You want a team to win all the time. Why? Because then you have the rivalries, and then it forces you to level up, mm. not through a system that allows there to be a level playing field. Right, right. So it's going to be an interesting next few years. I mean, if, yeah. if Kyle want to bridge that gap, then definitely there's going to be a bit of work to be done. Yeah. yeah. And losing someone like Jordan Minters is obviously going to be a hard one to replace. Yeah. I saw him leave. So. Terenganu, I believe. Yeah. In, well, good in for Malaysia. him. Though. Great for, and, and also great for the club for, in terms of really accelerating his development and, yeah. and moving on to, to another level. Yeah. Let's see what happens with him. We're excited yeah. to see how it, how it pans out for him. I think the club's been very good at that. Like yeah. Not holding any No, no, no. I think back. they're good like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of a random one this one from malia soccer um a shout out to the buddy with glasses by the way that was also his question was okay. asking why you would stay loyal to Kyle. yeah 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 um malia um who is the best soccer player in the world right now messi next and a shout out please hello <laughs> <laughs> um would you be interested in taking a job at the pff <laughs> uh i said i'd answer everything right mm. You know what I said before? Dream job, in many ways, would be to be like a youth <clears throat> development officer or you know, head of youth development. I don't want to be taking anyone's job. Like if people, someone's in that job already. Yeah, or yeah, someone, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, I I feel like 
implementation of a grassroots program is, is something that I would, in terms of offering like services, like it doesn't have to be like a formal role, but like something like that, I, I, I think I would be um, useful in, in that capacity. Would people want to listen to me? I don't know, I, 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 probably not. And that's something that <coughs> you were sort of talking about it a little bit earlier. I, I don't profess to know everything. Far, far from it. I, I'm, I, I definitely have a thirst for knowledge and, and always want to explore and learn new things. But I think also in going on co coaching courses, you know, like your UA for A licenses, for example, and you learn certain things, you are obligated to share that information. Mm. But someone needs to listen. Yeah, yeah. Right? So if you're going to share stuff, if you're going to... And, and not... So it comes from a perspective that you, you, you have all the answers or that you're holier than thou, you know, because that, mm. that's definitely not what I want to try and get... The point I want to get across. But like, for example, I'll sit in youth meetings and I'll be like, the fields are too small. The reason why U7s need to play on a bigger field is because they can't control the ball very well. Yeah. Right? So they need to play on a bigger field, not on a smaller field, because they are small. Mm. Right? Because invariably what happens is the ball spends most of its time off the field. Sure. So in terms of, although you're playing 15 minutes, the amount of time that the ball is actually in play is probably about two or three. So whose development are you affecting there? Right? It's the kids that you're affecting. Mm. So we should make the fields bigger. Ah, oh, Chris, but we don't have the, uh, the, the time or the facilities right, for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. But that's what you need to do if you want to develop players, right? So it's, it's these sorts of things that I find frustrating from, um, from that perspective. And if you were given, given the opportunity to implement a youth structure or to implement some sort of um, youth program, yeah. I think that's really where my strengths would lie if you were to take on something within within a federation. But um, I'm not great at playing a political game, so I'll see how um, if that's something that will happen in the future. That's interesting. You, there's, there's obviously two very clear passions for you is you know being in the in, ins and outs of like a pro team mm -hmm. and, and, and being competitive in that regard. Um, and then there's also the youth um, development side of you that uh, has obviously been a little bit more highlighted in the last few years mm -hmm. or, or this year in yeah. particular. Um, what do you feel uh, y your passion lies more if you were made to choose? Like, there can only be one. Chris, you can only be youth program head mm. um, of the Philippines or in charge of a large organization in youth development or mm. um, you, can cap you can coach a top side, compete at the AFC Cup or at a high level in, in the region. Um, what would you choose? I don't know. How I, would I really don't know the answer to that question I t and I'll tell you why. Like the AFC Cup thing for me is, is is fine, but like my my ambitions are much bigger than that. Mm. One thing that I realised when I went on the coaching course, when, and I was mixing with coaches from or former players who played at the highest level. Although I wasn't capable of playing at the highest level, I'm definitely capable of coaching at the highest level. And by the highest level, I don't mean AFC. Mm. If I'm talking about like a dream job, it would be probably as an assistant coach of a Premier League team. That would be a dream job mm. in terms of even as a head coach, like uh, Premier League, that's, that's, that's hard. Imagine walking down the street every day and getting abused from fans or families getting abused from fans or whatever, you know, like that, that level of responsibility and that level of pressure. Like, I'm not sure if that, that's appealing. I'm really not sure if that's appealing. Um, what I find appealing about coaching is actually being on the grass and working with people on a day to day mm. um, <clears throat> affecting people with a session affecting people with your interactions developing and improving an individual player and or a team um, so I, you can do that in a number of different ways you know so it's really just about where you can develop the most both as a coach both as an individual and where you can affect the team or individuals the most. Um, don't get me wrong, like the buzz and the, the the thrill of coaching like men's football at the pro level yeah. is exciting, don't get me wrong. But you also get a buzz from working on day to day, working with kids and seeing them develop and seeing them improve. So um, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, but 
for me how I see myself developing is and I'll see how I see how it goes I'm in no rush to make decisions to make calls you I've, I've thought about it a, a number of times you also got to take in consideration your family and your kids and what's best for them for sure you know um but I definitely feel as though as I go on this coaching journey that I'm I'm, I'm confident very confident in my ability to coach very yeah. confident and you know I won't settle for anything unless I feel as though I can make significant impact or I feel it's, it's, it's at the level that is where I'm at right now. Very interesting. Very interesting to see like where you... So for now, still going to continue with the academy. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, and there's a lot of work to be done here in the Philippines and I don't feel like my work is done yet. Yeah. Yeah. But down the road, yeah, I, I, I see myself coaching at the highest level for sure. Premier League, huh? Yeah, I mean, listen. If no one, if if you don't back yourself, yeah. who is going to back you? No, that's. I, Do you know I, what I mean? Like, yeah. it's really interesting. I talk to Phil Young Husband a lot about this, and like, he, he uh, his academy director was a guy called Neil Bath, and Neil basically oversaw a bunch of coaches who came through the system and now have household names. So, um, Brendan Rogers is probably the most high profile of the guys who came through the academy, and then and then obviously went on to the first team level. Um, but yeah, on the on the coaching course. I, I had some some incredibly, incredibly um, wonderful things said by people who I really admire within within the football world. You know, played at the highest level. Yeah. You know, and if and if they think I'm good, you know, if they would consider me a good coach, or yeah. if they're you know if they're saying look, no, you could coach at at, at the level that I've been at. Yeah. Then obviously that instills you with a lot of confidence. Other things need to align, like I said before. You you know there's obviously hundreds of people who want to be coached thousands of people who would, would love the opportunity to coach at that sort of level um, but I'm not shy of the hard work and I'm not shy of intimating my ambitions yeah really. but yeah I'm not in any hurry like I, I, I think that's also one of the problems that a lot of coaches have is they're in a, in a rush to get to where they want to go yeah but I see this more of a journey and um, yeah I'll, I'll take my time so I always found that interesting about you like exactly what you just said like you're not very shy about saying what your ambitions are mm. and how high you want to reach mm. which is kind of um not, a, not as common in the philippines you know like yeah. people who say that they're going to reach this high yeah. are often misconstrued as uh yeah bang. yeah yeah, bang, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, you know? yeah. So i think Chris, neil said it as well right it wants to come it comes across as a bit arrogant and yeah. maybe yeah yeah but you have to have confidence in yourself yeah and you know what in coaching at the highest level it might not necessarily be coaching at the premier league yeah do you know what i mean that, that might that isn't maybe that's not highest level right what? if you're second assistant if you're second or third assistant at an academy uh liverpool mm. you know are you coaching at a higher level than someone who's coaching the men's team in league two i don't know probably not Mm. right probably not that's probably a higher level yeah so it just depends on how you see level but for me it's not about it's, it's where you can also develop develop players develop yourself mm. uh, have impact you know so there's there's loads of different things that will that i have to weigh up before making a decision as to whether or not i'm going to take opportunity elsewhere uh and at the moment i feel that that's 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 down the line that's down the line for me yeah Interesting to see where that leads. Uh, Andrew T, this one. Um, I wanted to ask you about athletic nutrition and what the typical diet is for you. <laughs> if you have a diet for the season and Terrible. for the off season, or do you just maintain one diet for both? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of my weak, weak, weakest points. Diet. Because of the what? Because of your oh, just, for crisps or what? Is yeah. This? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mate. Right. For those potato chips is my weakness. Yeah. In fact, just potatoes in general. Yeah. Yeah. Fries. Or yeah. Hash but, browns. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just hitting everything. Huh? Ev everything. Keep going if you want. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Diet was never my strongest suit. I think I've got a good metabolism, so for whatever reason, I don't put on a lot of weight. Oh. Okay. Um, actually, that's a lie. I was about 76 kilos the turn of this year which was heavy for me really playing weight i was 72 73 All right. i would go on the scales on a monday and i would tell eunice the pt i would tell her what i would be massa <laughs> would always laugh because he would he would know <laughs> i would i wouldn't have to i would just say i would just step on and be like 72.5 or 73 i would yeah. know i would know without even looking yeah and they'd be like yeah okay 73 you're right yeah you write it down <laughs> i would i would not, not fluctuate but i got to 76 yeah 
then I just had to manage my portions and then I ended up, I'm a, I'm, I'm at 70 kilos now. Mm. And I've stayed that way since about February. So I lost it pretty quick. Okay. So two months and I lost six kilos and then 70 whole year. But what is it? What what is it? Uh, I mean, obviously you're not just eating chips all day, right? I mean, what else no. are you eating? I mean, what, I mean you when not, I played, what's your when regular? I, meal? Yeah, when I played, I just, you know, Ali's the one, and he, he would baffle me with some of the stuff he would be talking about, like the diets and how he would go about sure, his nutrition sure. and stuff. Yeah, I'm just a normal. I just eat a normal, normal. I have just a normal diet. What's normal? Normal, just <laughs> I don't know. Rice and I, chicken. No, no yeah. maybe not so much rice, but. Yeah, just chicken, uh, pasta. Okay. Uh, just, yeah, don't have massive portions. Don't <laughs> eat too much fat. Uh, yeah. Don't drink loads of soda. Yeah, I've yeah. got a little bit of a pension for soda, but yeah, I don't go crazy. You're not Robert just, Lovers Mendy. No. <laughs> oh my gosh, that boy would drink Cobras and sodas <laughs> at 6.30 in the morning yeah, and yeah. then run like a ma maniac. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't change. One thing I'll say about diet is it's, just find what fits for you. Yeah. That's really what I, I want get, to get across. Like I would, I would hear all these diets that were great or foods that you're supposed to eat. And then six months later, you'd be, oh no, that's terrible. You shouldn't be eating that. If you find something that works for you and it makes you feel good. Yeah. Right. Stick with that. Yeah. Stick with that. Experiment, see what works, what doesn't work. That's the best advice I can really give with regards to that. I diet. think that's pretty sound. Anything I think. thereafter, <laughs> speak to Ali. Oh, or, or a qualified nutritionist. Not Speaking really my fault. Ali, Ali's going to come on the show soon, huh? He needs to, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one's Chris Villa Serran. You will be quite familiar with her. Oh, my gosh. Uh, What's she going to say? Go on, go on ask, yeah. She's just asking um, having managed both Filipino and foreign players. And this one's very interesting, actually. Yeah. If you've managed both Filipino, Phil foreigners, mm. and um, foreigners. Yeah. Um, is there a significant difference between both and how do you manage Filipino players being more sensitive than others perhaps or w what do you feel yeah I found, how, how would you categorize that? I would I found that yeah I found that working with that group homegrown players being a little bit more sensitive, sensitive. yeah so just as an example I can't I would if I would lambast certain players yeah um, Louis Clark it's not with a foreigner Lam I would lambast Louis Clark no problem sometimes it would get a really positive resp response from him. He also walked out of a training session once when I lambasted him. Really? Yeah. So two ends of the scale with, with, with dealing with someone like that. And he was someone who I went too far that way yeah. with Louis and I regretted that. And I told him so and I apologized. So I, I, people just would, because I've known Louis since he was a kid and um, people would assume that there was a level of friendship and I went too far the other way in mm. terms of trying to exert my authority over him. So one of the things that I would regret However, I have found in my experience that the foreign players that I've dealt with have uh, a higher tolerance for um, for that side of, of the game. So if I have to give direct feedback, yeah. they would be more accepting, more tolerant and would understand, right, if it's half time and I've only got a short window of opportunity to give information, if I need to be very direct with, with my information, I can give that to you directly. Yeah. Even if it can be harsh. Even if it might sound harsh, I don't have to tippy toe around the issue mm. so much. Um, that being said, we had players with a strong mentality. Right. So if I'm going to tell something to Alfred Osai, despite the fact that he internalized some of the, the yeah, stuff, yeah. he's pretty good with that. Mendy, pretty good with that. Uh, Jordan, funny enough, was a bit more sensitive. So everyone's different. Jordan was a little bit more sensitive. He was a little bit more sensitive. I remember one time after a game once, he was upset that I didn't go up to him and ask him how he was after, his uh, after he got injured in the game. Right, Do you right. remember the game against, uh, we won against Davao? Yeah, scored, scored within like and, a few seconds. And then got injured, right? Yeah. So he's like acting up in the change room and I, and I basically said, well, why are you acting like a dick? And then he gave me some soppy answer. So I pulled him into the office and I said, don't ever talk to me like that again. And what's the real problem? Yeah. And then he did, oh, you didn't ask how I was. And I was like, okay. So that just has to show you that, you know, it doesn't, you can't treat, you can't say all foreigners are right, right. tough and all locals are sensitive. But, uh, <clears throat> because I, you know, there are players who, there are local players who I could hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Like a bit of tough love. Yeah. You could be tough with them. You try, you try being uh, fucking Audi Menzi. Yeah. Or, you know, there'll be times that I just, 
maybe wouldn't bollock them. I wouldn't be, but I'd be like, you know, you, you need to be more physical. You need, you know, especially someone of that na- na- nature, right? I yeah. mean, he's a very powerfully built individual. You can, you can be like that with him. Yeah. You can rile him up. And then he, uh, his brother was the same. Mm. His brother was the same. Not all the time. Yeah. Not all the time. I think, but I, but I would agree with Chris to a degree that uh, if you're sort of, as a, as a, as a, Broader, broader group. I think Filipinos, you, you'd have to be more sensitive with how you deliver your information. Yeah, I would. I would use Joven a lot with that. So Joven would be a very good spokesperson for me. So if I felt that something was awry with a group, I would have him speak to them as a group, mm. and obviously delegate some of that responsibility to him as the captain, as the leader, because right. he could speak in their in their native tongue. He was had a close relationship with them. It wouldn't seem so harsh if it came from him. Yeah, you know, if it could be a small issue, it could be a small issue. Things like tardiness, right? being late for training, yeah, yeah, right. You know, just making sure that people were on the bus on time. You yeah. know, little things like that it doesn't have to come from me. And it might be, listen, Joven, can you have a word with the guys about making sure that the guys can be on the bus on time? Yeah, sure. Okay, I can do that for you. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to come. You know, rather than they all arrive late and I, you know, single out every individual for being late and, and lambast them in front of everyone. So, um, I think that was that was a key, and that's something I learned as I as I progressed in my coaching career was that everyone's different and you have to treat them individually um, and then for certain things you have to delegate those responsibilities mm. I look at someone like Miguel Tanton who was a difficult character to handle in many respects because he could be one minute he'd be super positive bundle of energy next minute he could be acting like a little kid uh, jo- you know, jovial, laughing and joking, hard to control that way. Yeah. He could be petulant at times. He could be fiery and, you know, he could lose lose his marbles. So you couldn't treat him the same as you would a Jason Panay. You have to treat him differently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then tailor your response or your, how you would interact with him accordingly. Uh, and then I got better at managing individuals like him the more time that I spent with him. So, yeah, for me it was... It was just a case of um, I mean, him. How many other Phil foreigners did we have? Um, Adam Reed. Yeah, Reed. But then Reed was English, so, you know. So he was similar to me. So he was another one. I could I could hammer him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I could hammer him, and then once once you, I delivered the message, just put my arm around him and say, "Listen, Reedy, you know, you can't go around two fitting people in the in the head. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, that's not acceptable." And he'd be like, "Yeah, you're right. You're right." But I need to set an example right, for right. everyone because if I let you get away with that, you know, it's going to be a problem. That's why I bollocked you. Yeah, okay, okay. You're right, you're right. So it's about making those personal connections as well. I you think have it's to know who. You, you have, have, to, you know have who. to know who the audience so, is. And I don't want to say that all fi- local Filipinos are sensitive. Really sensitive. Right, right. Really was sensitive. Yeah, yeah. You know, but he was also someone I could probably bollock in yeah. front of everyone, you know. So just different, different ways, trying to figure out which buttons to push. I think that's the key, irrespective of whether they're a foreigner Local, Phil Farina. Uh Shout out to the Filipino with the most Spanish name ever, Paulo Miguel Garcia Gomez. Hello. No, sir. that yeah, can't be real. Yeah, it's his name, Paulo Miguel Garcia Gomez. Okay. How are you, sir? Can a short keeper make it out there in the big leagues? Can I? Can a short keeper make it out there in the big leagues? Yes. Fabian Barthez, sir. Yeah. Look into it. It's hard. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the game, especially for goalkeepers, is becoming increasingly... Um, how how you can play with the ball at your feet? Sure, you know Jordan Pickford, yeah. R- Reedy's very good friend. He was yeah. at Sunderland with Reedy from when he was a young young child. So yeah, I mean he's he's phenomenal with his feet, you know. So I think it's possible. Uh, I mean it depends how small. You can have a five foot one goalkeeper. <laughs> right. I mean yeah, right. you know, like, to a certain degree you got to be able to you know leap and touch the posts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. At I least mean, cover your frame. And then you look at someone like, when I look at Cassas versus a Neil Etheridge, if you look at a Cassas versus a Roland Muller versus a Neil Etheridge, yeah. like when I look at Neil and goal, there's no room. Yeah, it's a behemoth. Yeah, it just doesn't look like there's anywhere you could put the ball. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, things like that, you know, from a physical standpoint, it does make a difference. Sure. Do you ha- but then again, Neil's not as good as his feet with Jordan P- as Jordan Pickford, mm. right? So, you know, um, these are the things that we need to, to, to consider. Is it essential? No. Yeah. There's probably like, like we're, there's certain things that you need, right? Are you going to be a basketball player if you're going to be four foot five? Are you going to be a swimmer if you're 
under five foot. No, there probably needs to be a certain minimum requirement sure. that you would have to have yeah, in yeah. order to, to play in that position. And then there's going to be outliers. And there's going to be outliers. But if they're going to be outliers, you better have a skill set yeah. through the roof and there's some of those other, other areas. Right. So there you go. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, here, uh, best young prospect in the country right now. Oof. Well, I'm not going to go down the usual routes, right? So you're going to ask me if like a Harvey guys or whatever. Sure. Like, listen, they'll, they, they, they've got enough profile. They've got enough uh, they're on UAP. They're on, you know, they have all those all those highlights. So these are the guys you know about. If you want me to go and single one out, I'm not going to. Yeah. There are some kids under the radar, like I think, that are coming through the the system. Certainly at my club, that I would like to highlight. Um, so we've got our under 15s, for example. We've got a bunch of players who made the made the youth national team. Mm. Uh, so we have a young boy, Enzo Corbet, French Filipino, mm. very very good player. Um, goes to Brent. Super smart, big, athletic, um, sort of Pogba in his makeup, could probably play attacking midfield, could play defensive midfield, yeah. could play centre back, good leader, good uh, vocally, um, great organiser. He's someone I think we can look out for um, within his age group. Enzo Corbet. Enzo right. Corbet, good player. Within the same team, you've got um, the Seljan twins, Mikhail and um, Mateo, whose father is of. Boot camp fame. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, lovely family, f football oriented. Uh, both of them are, are, are players who are, I think have a, have a bright uh, bright future. Um, their cousin is Gael Guerrero. Um, father is Paco Guerrero, the photographer, National yeah, Geographic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another another su super player, great great quality at the back. Um, big, imposing physically. Um, another one who I think has is, 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 is got potential. Currently in the under-15 setup, these guys? No, uh, Enzo was. Uh, those mm. those two are a year younger, so they're actually U14, moving I into see. U15. The other guys from the under-15s were the, some of our kids from the GK community. Mm. So we had Sian Galsim um, and uh, Benji Palacios. So they are from the GK community. Nice. Um, have been with us for four years, maybe. Um, supremely talented learnt through street football came to us as these raw rough diamonds and then coach thomas our swiss coach has just polished them up and now yeah just came went, went with the most recent national team trip um both of them played they've got real future they've got real future but there's another guy who won our, our team mvp a guy called julian romero um again same community cycles every day to training from Keson City Ooh. to McKinley Hill. <laughs> wow. Right? So, wow. so again, it kind of comes <clears throat> back to what we were saying earlier about, yeah, they, they, my kid lives, breathes football. Yeah, yeah. Right? Does he though? If mum and dad or the driver can't take him to training, is he getting the training? Right? Is he finding a way to get to training? Yeah. Right? Because I know Julian Romero rides his bike <clears throat> along C5. That right? is and, nuts. And, and risks probably killing himself three times a week how old is he 14 15 my man i gotta shake this kid's yeah. head top player top player pitbull midfielder just bags of energy um unafraid you know uh, i'm trying to think of a comparison who he would be like maybe like a uh, varan varan type you know just all action yeah, Gatt yeah. even gattuso would probably be a quite a, that, that type just a pitbull midfielder um, just not afraid of anyone, I you know. Um, too, so. so that type mm. of that type of player, he's someone yeah. to look out for. So, no, I can only really comment from my own academy because that's where my my vested interest is in, and it's uh, awesome too. And what I work with, and yeah. I've got to back my own product, right? So if I'm going to back anyone, those there are some some kids that are coming through. Nathan Batter, goalkeeper, also another one to look out for. Top top goalkeeper. Uh, these are some fun prospects to look out to. Yeah, uh, yeah, look yeah. at um, uh, and follow as well because they're like five, four years down the road into making it into you know full. That's what I think. Year. Yeah, I mean, a lot so. of those kids they went to watch the C games. Yeah, you know, under twenty twos, and I was looking at it thinking, you, you're not far off. Yeah, yeah. Did they you're enjoy that? Did they yeah, enjoy loved, that loved it, mate. Loved it. Yeah, I came away with a newfound perspective and enthusiasm for for football, which is important. Speaking of the C games, who was your standout um, prospect from there? Um, standout prospect. Probably Galantis in terms of someone who was off the radar and then, mm. you know, really put in a good performance in, in, in the competition and, and, and came out with it. Um, looking like he could make the step up 
Uh, Bass obviously had been involved with the national team as well, but performed well. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think ultimately, if you really want to have a look at it, I mean, Shockey and Namani were the, were the standout performers, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, and is, maybe it's a bit of a cop out from me. Um, but yeah, there's some of the names. I think obviously, I think it was mentioned um, Suba did well. Didn't he? Suba, yeah, Suba yeah, did well yeah. in, in some of the cav- cameo roles that he played. I remember you, you picked out a couple of players also, didn't you, from the Sea Games? You felt. I thought Diano was good. Diano, yeah. You Diano said, stood out for yeah. me because no, there was very low expectations yeah. going into it. And in fact, some of the people were, raised their eyebrows that why is Diano there yeah. and, instead of Marco Cassambra? Yeah. And uh, he didn't... He didn't, um, didn't look out of place. So. Yeah. yeah. And scored a goal against Timor Leste. Nice little header there. So I think his stock definitely rose, rose yeah. in yeah. this one. I'll take that one as well. So yeah, a few names there. Um, yeah. I think we're, we've gone through pretty much all of the, the questions here. Um, that we've had yeah um, the last one is being how far or close are we from making the World Cup this one coming from Mark Christopher Pangelina Flor de Liza. I like how everybody's like got their entire name on their, on their Facebook man it's like full names not afraid of your privacy being put out there I was literally there, what huh? I was about to say mate yeah. And, yeah and we've just named them so yeah well yeah. appreciate it I appreciate yeah. it yeah we have to give them a shout out um, I, th- I still think we're a long way off how long I still think we're a long way off. You know what? Expanded expanded format in four years' time. Is it, though? Because they've said that before, and I'm not sure. No, they're going to do it. They said it was sure They said it was going to be in Russia. Which, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, well, that, it's going to be a bit of an happen. issue, right? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I don't know. I think a lot of things need to change first, right? I think a lot of things need to change before that becomes a possibility. And I'm not saying that we're not bridging the gap at all. Yeah. You know, like if you just look at even these World Cup qualifiers, the team's done, it's done well up until this point, mm. you know, and, and feasibly they've got sort of, I don't want to say easier games coming up, but the fixtures are favourable in terms of playing more home games. And then obviously the China away game will be the... Yeah, yeah. The big test. Probably the big test to see if we can potentially get that second place, best second place. Yeah spot so let's see um i when i was working with scott we really felt if there was an expanded qatar um with the players we were looking to bring in that we had a really good chance Mm -hmm. i genuinely believe that i genuinely believe that obviously if it's not an expanded format and if it's it's some of the players i mean like padanka for example um it was the guy who came to the china trip but didn't he didn't get his passport. Okay. Filipino Spanish guy. Um, Good player, I'm presuming. <laughs> yeah. Imagine Alvaro Silva, but bigger. Bigger? Yeah, bigger. More vocal, more aggressive, if you can imagine. Mm. That no nonsense Spanish kind of. Younger? I don't. Th- uh, I think he's younger than Alvaro, yeah, but not. I, I think he's late 20s, early 30s, something mm. like that. But um, yeah, if you were able to get some of those players in. Um, there's other players of that pedigree obviously like um, Kempter for example yeah yeah. Um, there's other names that are in that mix but just you know so if you're able to secure some of those passports then, then it, 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 it it just gives you a greater pool of players to, to potentially utilise so then it's, it's reliant on acquiring the talent required for that yeah I think so and, I, then, and then obviously having the, the backing to do it whether that be financially whether that be um, assisting with all of the logistical s- stuff that is required in order to do that. Because the question is just whether we can make it, right? And how long are we, are we from making it? I mean, at any given point in time, any cycle, if you are acquiring the right people and keeping the, uh, you know, a decent coaching staff together, yep, it's possible. It's possible. And if you throw some money at it, it's possible. But it's the possible. question is, how do you become a World Cup team? That's, that's a separate question. It's like, how do you become separate a, question. a regular occurrence in the world cup no and that's a different thing. separate question right yeah so there, 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 there is scope for that yeah there is scope if you throw enough money at it and you're able to acquire yeah and you have a clear plan it's possible mm. it is possible because i i believe that the, the talent is actually there it is there north korea for example was there yeah they did it just a few you know uh world cups ago right yeah. they did it so it's not impossible it's to not make it there but no. you know um if you're going to want to keep making it to the world cup then you know, we're definitely going to make Altogether. some changes right yeah so then um we've gone through a lot of questions Have man. We? um I, I believe so how'd you find it is first, that it first ever um you and ask me anything um for chris Greyrich. um i thought i thought we did good i thought we got through 
just about every every one of the questions. So okay, thank you to everybody who who sent in over Facebook, over Instagram, um, uh, over Twitter. I presume uh, look for across the line on all three of those platforms and make sure you guys follow us and um, subscribe to those uh, channels and make sure to send us comments and suggestions and questions and we'd love to go through them uh, in w- in one of these episodes whenever we get a chance. I think so. Uh, yeah, and just off the back of that, if anyone wants any topics covered, I know we said that before, mm. uh, and we have gone over some of those topics, haven't we? Yeah. Um, so if anyone is out there that would like a topic covered, or would like us to expand on some of the things that we've talked about here in this Q and A session, um, yeah, we're more than happy to listen to those and and uh, prospectively put an episode out. Um, this one I, I didn't ask you because I'm pretty sure what your answer would be. But mm. would you ever run as a PFF president? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, get this uh, uh, person a, a shout out. Sure. Um, Thank you for the question. No. Emiliano, um, what do you think of football stadiums in the Philippines? Need to be closer to the pitch. Mm. I need, need more soccer specific stadiums. The best stadium that I've played in since I've been here, McKinney Hill. Yeah. Best stadium. Anybody who you feel as if, if you didn't play any competitive football, you could still be a good coach? Would you say, 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 ask that again, sorry? Say again. If you didn't play any competitive football, would you still, is it possible for you to still Oh, I saw that coach? question. I saw that question. <coughs> sorry, I, I, I might have glossed over some of how, these. How, I mean, competitive, you, you need to have a certain level, right? You, so you need to have a certain level of understanding and expertise. Yeah. Right, so that, that although it's, it's not about the X's and O's, I, I can't go and coach w- water polo. Yeah. Right. And just think that it's all going to be about me building a relationship with these guys. There needs to be a certain level of credibility. So, yeah, yeah. so I think that needs to be relative. Right. So you can't go and, uh, oh, yeah, my last coaching job was I was coaching, you know, some rec team. And now I want to go and coach at the PFL level. Like that's just not going to happen. Sure. So, but, you know, if you're saying to me, like, I've worked in football, mm. like, so let, let's say, for example, if, like Mourinho, for example, do you know how, uh, how, how, how Mourinho ended up? I know that he was like a mediocre player. Yeah, so goalkeeper, so, yeah, was he? Yeah, so long story short, his big break was was as the interpreter to Bobby Robson at Barcelona. Oh wow! Right, so 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 basically, he he worked in coaching before. Yeah, uh, and worked in um, different uh, aspects of of football, and then ended up as an interpreter for Bobby Robson. So he basically, had a front row seat. To one of the so, greatest managers. Yeah, yeah. and certainly of, of my era. I mean, I remember being England <coughs> manager. You know, he was there with the, the original Ronaldo um, yeah. you know, at, at Barcelona, Pep Guardiola. You know, all these guys were there. Um, and then he was learning. And then while he was learning, formulating his own ideas, then sharing them with Sir Bobby Robson. And, it's you great. know, that. so he had no real playing experience. And certainly didn't play at the highest level. Um, and then was able to harness all of that knowledge and then deliver that. I think the same was about Andre Villas-Boas was uh, how he got his big break was he lived in the same building as Mourinho um, and then did a scouting report for him. Wow. And did a dossier and then was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. So in order to be a good coach, yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't have to. You don't have to have been a good player or, or played at a certain, you know, that highest level. I don't believe that at all. Yeah, but but you do need to have a certain understanding of the game, yeah. And that could be that can be formulated a number of different ways. Um, but I think if you are like a Guardiola, where you have played at the highest level, you have got incredible insight. You can then temper that with incredible tactical knowledge and yeah. delivering in, 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 you know, in incredible sessions. I've seen his sessions and the amount of enthusiasm that he delivers them with, you know, the energy then obviously that's that's when you're going to be king um so yeah i don't i don't think it is necessary 100 percent, but there needs to be a level of a base level of understanding to begin with all right fair enough is that fair yeah yeah it puts you in a in a decent spot you you you've got some good playing years Uh, under you relatively yes okay (laughs) um um I think the last one is just um, if you're in the PFF, what do you think needs to be changed? Is it grassroots program? What yes. would be the priority? That yes. would be the priority. Yes. Yeah, and then the league. That one coming to right. uh, Luke Transporto. Uh, yeah, I think. Transporto. Yeah, Luke. Obviously, he likes to show the name. I'm definitely. I think you've got to start grassroots, and we've elabor- I've elaborated on yeah. how I would do it. I'm not giving them a blueprint. Yeah. If you wanna, you wanna call me, you know where I am. 
and then obviously putting the, a, a nice league for them to to showcase that talent. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then obviously then filling in the gaps in between. I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's rocket science. I think we need to be focusing on the top end as well as the grassroots. Um, the other one that I haven't really talked about there is the women's. I think that needs to be harnessed as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one that that is an underserved community within our our football world, right. and it's one that is just praying and begging for someone to come in and say right we're going to try and take you guys to the next level because i think they're one that really can explode 100%. given the opportunity yeah 100 percent. all right thank you to rico merck ryan phoenix uh brando barombado uh mark castilleja mikey like my uh luke trasporto uh, lubis ratno who was asking if you would be a, a, if there was an expansion to the s league and there was a filipino club that would be, get involved would you be interested in oh it? that's a good one yeah 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 why not JP Kemp um, uh, Eros uh, Miya, Miyuga uh, Rene Devina um, Jimmy Tu Best Gaskell of all time Jerry Lucena all right yeah so that one, uh, I explained why before right? yep, yep. yeah top player if you if you want the back explanation go back to the best 11 of the Ascals yes uh, go back to that episode please uh, Kurt Panong um, no he was not going to get involved in the UAP teams what about under 19 under 22 would you be interested in those national team setups? I think they're a bit of a poison chalice, aren't they? Mm. The youth, the underage competitions. I think given the resources, given the opportunity, given the right competition. It's possible. Possible, but it's um, it hasn't been that way for a number of years. And I feel as though a lot of times it's you, you're giving a lot of those coaches a handicap from the get-go. Right. So they take it with all the right intentions, but ultimately it's... Um, Tough spot to be put in. Yeah. Emiliano, thank you for your question. Bill Pakatang, uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, John Kimbao, Isaac Quintilia, um, Raul Ilanan. Um, your personal takeaways from the Sea Games performances. Mm. I think we. Yeah, we, if you want to listen to that one, we did a Sea Games yeah. episode. We obviously discussed that. Ultimately, uh, yeah, although it's, it's, it pains me to say, I was right. I didn't think we had the firepower to qualify yeah. um, for the, was it the 6-0 the victory that was required? Actually, we needed seven. Seven, and ultimately seven, yeah. based on the, the, the other results of the other games. Um, I think now, having the conclusion of the, of, the, of the competition, we can look at it perhaps with a slightly different perspective, which ultimately, and I, I don't want to be on a, on a downer with the competition because there were many positives to take from that, from that competition. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the Malaysia game was a great win. I think overall the team played a really good brand of football. There were some really exciting elements to it. The Malaysia win was a great win, historic win. And the general feel-good factor from the tournament as a whole was, was, is, is something that we cannot overlook. But ultimately, both teams fell short of the, of the goal. Mm -hmm. and both teams fell short of I think the women's team were expecting to medal and the, the men's team were at least expected to get out of the group which ultimately they didn't do and then I think the, the powers that be need to go back take a look reflect and really analyse as to why that was because in, in that respect it was a missed opportunity because there were so many positives to come out of that competition yeah. I don't want to make it out to be a downer as well because I think there's, there's certain things that are more important than actually qualifying Sure. right so, so some of the the re-engagement with the fans, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the like, like I said, the feel-good factor around the games as a whole. It, that's that that needs to be harnessed. And if we and if that can be projected and reflected in what we do with grassroots football, or what what happens with the league moving forward, then then that will supersede anything that happened with the sure. results itself. Yeah, yeah, does that make sense? Sure. But for me, in terms of the actual, if you want to step back and look at it, then ultimately the. Um, we need to really, really look at why we were unable to a qualify at the group or medal with the women's team. Sure. And try to figure out what moving forward, what the best way in which we could approach that for the next SEA Games because it happens again in two years' time, right? Yep. And, yep. We, and we've got to look at it and 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 hopefully bridge the gap. Yeah, bridge the gap exactly. Hundred percent. Agree with you there. Well, this has been fun, man. That's I it. Think, Is that all of them? Yeah. Oh, I, I think I, I went through each and every one. I tried to, um, you know, inject um, the questions in the right possible. You know, opportunity uh, as we flowed through all the questions that, that that came in, but at the end of the day, we went through all of them. So um, that was a good number, huh? A good. lot of people. Yeah, it's just on short notice. Yeah. So yeah, if, if there if we do it again, or if there's any other questions that anyone wants to answer, we're more than happy to um, discuss them as a as a full episode. If if uh, if anyone would like to 
send us a comment yep. or a suggestion for, for future episodes. Thank you for everybody who viewed this live on, on Facebook and whoever who's going to be coming in and listening to it. We hope you enjoy the show. If you like this across the line episode and for if you enjoy all the football content that we provide, definitely do subscribe uh, on YouTube, on Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. If you have the time, extra time, definitely rate and review it. Drop us a line there. Um, it really helps in getting it out to, to more of your friends um, and to the football community here in the Philippines.